Welcome to Jerry Beckett's Industrial Manufacturing Podcast. We're excited to kick off our latest series, Recession Readiness, Strategies to Take the Lead, where, we'll, where we will discuss the current state of the economy and the risk of a recession. We will be exploring a variety of strategies manufacturers can implement today to proactively rein in costs while simultaneously reinvesting in growth. I'm Johanna and I'm a partner at the firm and I focus my practice on serving national, international, industrial manufacturing clients with a focus on automotive and mobility. Today I'm joined with Chad Mutre, the chief economist of the National Association of Manufacturers, NAM. Chad also serves as the director of the Center for Manufacturing Research at the Manufacturing Institute. He is the vice chair of the Conference of Business Economists. He holds a PhD from Southern Illinois University and a bachelor's and master's degree in economics from Eastern Illinois University. Chad also publishes the Monday Economic. Chad also publishes the Monday Economic Report, which I can highly recommend. Welcome, Chad. That's always great to be on the podcast, Joe. Thanks for inviting me. Let's dive in. The focus of today's podcast is to review the current economic stage and to discuss the future expectations regarding a potential recession, which we can read about in the news every day now. From your perspective, Chad, what is the manufacturing outlook right now? So the manufacturing economy is, is kind of a combination of good news and bad news, right? So it's a much more mixed picture, much like you see in the press, right? And so I could paint a picture either way, right? Um, one of the words that I have continued to talk about all year long in my Monday economic report is the, that manufacturing has remained pretty resilient, right? Uh, and that's been true really over the last year or so, right? Despite, uh, you know, supply chain issues, inflation, workforce challenges, and just kind of this current worry about inflation and recession, you've seen overall that manufacturing activity continues to plug along, right? So we saw recent data for June <clears throat> for, for manufacturing orders were pretty strong, right? Even core capital goods spending have been has been pretty strong. You still see very um, solid numbers for manufacturing employment. We've added 272,000 workers already this year, and job openings continue to be solid. Um, and when you're looking at manufacturing, you know, PMIs, the Purchasing Managers Index, they're still showing growth overall, uh, even even as you're seeing some some weaker weaker data, right? So, on the one hand, you have resilience, right? Uh, but at the same time, um, those same PMI measures are showing that manufacturing activity is the weakest today than it has been in two years, right? Um, while manufacturing is is resilient, it is it is also not immune, right? Uh, and you're seeing some weakening uh, in new orders. You're seeing some weakening in exports. Um, and uh, I think the other key number to mention here is that more than half of our members in the NEM Manufacturers Outlook Survey that we did in June said that we they they expected a recession in the next year, right? And so uh, if if you are expecting a downturn or a recession, right? Uh, what does that mean? It means you're going to pull back on activity, right? And so that to me has been a red flag really for the last couple months of something that I've been watching. Uh, and you're seeing obviously the impact that the Fed has had, you're seeing the housing market weaken, you're seeing consumer spending weaken a little bit, right? And so all of that really plays into that larger manufacturing conversation. Uh, the good news is manufacturing continues to be resilient, but you are seeing uh, weakening out there, which I think is notable. And, and, um, uh, and that's, I think, certainly something for us to watch. Okay, no, that's 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 a great overview and kind of uh, showing that it's not as cut and dry as you would, you know, see from the economy books. You know, just looking at um, the numbers and statistics. Now, to ask you directly, are we in a recession? So this is also a complicated answer, right? Um, I mean, technically, I do not think we're in a recession. Um, and I, 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 I know that that has become a political conversation of, of, of late. Uh, we have had two consecutive quarters of declining GDP, right? And so most Americans, particularly if you took an econ class at any point in your career, uh, 
uh, no, learn that to be the lesson, right? That it's two, two consecutive quarters. And so we had uh, obviously uh, both the first and second quarter a declining output in the U.S. The challenge here is that uh, if this is a recession, it would be the only recession we've ever had that's a full employment recession, right? And so there are some, some caveats to those numbers, right? So if you go back to the first quarter, yes, we had negative growth of, of negative 1.6%, but that was largely due to net exports uh, and inventory, a reduction in inventories, right? If we, if we were just looking at consumer and business spending in the first quarter, it would have been solidly positive, right? So nearing 3% growth, right? So you almost feel like you have to throw out the first quarter, right? If for, just for that reason, although that's more of a technicality. And, and, and in the second quarter, obviously, uh, the employment numbers are strong, right? We have 3.5% unemployment, right? Uh, that's, that's the lowest we've had really since the pandemic began, which is essentially a 50-year low, right? Um, uh, and job openings continue to be solid, right? And so you have kind of this odd world here where, yes, you're seeing some signs of a downturn, but, uh, but there are a lot of other factors out there which suggest that um, – the National Bureau of Economic Research is not going to declare this to be an official recession, right? Now, all of that sounds like gobbledygook or maybe economic semantics. I, I suspect that uh, most businesses and consumers think we are in a recession or going into a recession, as I noted earlier. And so that might be um, a bit too technical for most folks, uh, particularly if you think we are in one, I think people are gonna react accordingly. Uh, my view is we are not officially in a recession, I don't think we'll, we'll, we will be in run going forward, uh, but that doesn't mean we won't slip into one at some point over the next year. Great. Now to move on, um, kind of pivoting towards uh, employment, growth and wages. What are you hearing in terms of employment, growth and wages? What What is the perspective to see with um, the NAM group, but also with your larger audience um, at this point? So I mentioned the NAM Manufacturers Outlook survey earlier. And so, you know, the number one and number two issues are obviously supply chain and inflation, right? But you've continued to hear uh, as that number three issue about labor force challenges. Uh, and, and every member that I talk to tells me that they're having trouble finding workers. Um, both on the attraction side as well as keeping the workers that they have. Uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, I also continue to hear that, you know, the competition for talent is just extreme at this point, right? It's a very tight labor market. It's not just manufacturing that's looking for workers. Every sector is looking for workers. Um, and if you don't believe me, just drive down the street and see all the signing bonuses and, you know, $18 an hour to work at fast food joints and a bunch of other things, right? Uh, and so that has made that competition, especially for entry-level workers, that much more difficult. Uh, and, and manufacturers have told me that they've had to raise wages two, three, sometimes four times over the last couple of years to feel like they were competitive locally with other sources uh, that, that were looking for work as well. Uh, we know just by looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers that on a year-over-year -year basis, um, average hourly earnings for production workers and manufacturing were up 5% year over year. Uh, a couple months ago, that was 5.7%. So you've seen a little bit of slippage there. Um, that 5.7 number was the most in 40 years. Um, and but even, even with some slippage, 5% uh, is still a, a high number, right? Um, and you're seeing not only companies paying roughly 5% more over the last year, but also expectations of, of, of wage hikes going down the line. Job openings are still just shy of 800,000, right, in, in terms of manufacturing job openings in the sector. Uh, and as I noted earlier, uh, you know, we've already added 270,000 or more workers this year, uh, and which is above pre-pandemic levels. We're back above where we were when the pandemic began. So a, a very tight labor market one that I expect to cool a little bit over the coming months, just given some of those other conversations we had in the first couple questions, but still a red hot job market. Uh, and uh, one that I suspect, uh, even as we move into 2023 and 2024, we're still gonna be talking about where is that next generation of worker gonna come from, right? So that, that's, that's one that I think is more of a structural issue and not a cyclical one. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think we, hear from our clients and um, having more conversations about, uh, you know, robotics, artificial intelligence to 
just um, kind of work against the the labor shortages because if you if you don't get the uh, the people, you got to think about okay, can you make some changes to your manufacturing to your operational um, so we, activities? We've heard, yeah, we've heard along those lines, Joe, that about forty five percent of our members said that they've had to turn away work because they don't have enough uh, employees to be able to take on new assignments, right? And so there's a real economic impact to this worker shortage that goes beyond, you know, just the normal things that you think of, right? Uh, uh, so that I think it's, 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 it's telling in and of itself. Yeah. Now, besides um, employment growth and wages you touched on, what would you say, which is certainly one of the bigger challenges for uh, industrial manufacturing here in the United States, what would you say are other challenges, bigger challenges for manufacturers right now? So there's a lot of problems that we just keep cropping up, right? Um, and so I, you know, when I talk to manufacturers, they just say it's one thing after another, right? Over the last couple of years, whether that was, you know, the trade war in 2019, uh, then obviously the pandemic and, and the impact that that had uh, on, on firms' ability to stay operational, right? Um, uh, and then obviously more recently, all the supply chain issues uh, and inflation and workforce. Uh, you know, to, to me, supply chain has become a bit of a buzzword, right? And it's, it's also become a bit of an umbrella, right? So if you, if you uh, for all problems, <laughs> right? So if you're talking to manufacturers about the issues that are facing them on that supply chain side, you're going to hear about the zero COVID policy in China, right? How, you know, in May and June, especially, uh, whole cities were shut down, and uh, and, and uh, this obviously affected production in China. It affected our ability to get inputs right from China. It affected the, the ports, right? Um, in my view, we could easily go back in that situation again. You're seeing rising COVID cases in China. They haven't shut down to the extent that they did in May and June, but there's always that threat out there. Uh, in the U.S., obviously, the port situation is better than it was, say, six months ago, but it's still not where it should be or where it was before the pandemic. Uh, there's a real worry about a, a West Coast port strike, right? Uh, that was it should, could have happened as, on, on June 30th, but essentially has been punted. You're having other issues at other ports as well, right? Where the backlog is just pretty significant. There's a real worry about a railway strike, right? There's the lack of truck drivers, right? And that the impact that that has had on, on shipping, uh, extraordinarily high freight costs, right? That, that, Certainly Absolutely. for small and medium-sized members have really um, uh, bitten into profits. Uh, and then obviously, as we noted earlier, just the lack of workers, right? So all of those things really have combined to, to really challenge manufacturers over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, you add to that weather has sometimes impacted that as well. Uh, and, and, you know, so we ask, also ask in our Outlook survey, when do members expect these supply chain issues will get better, right? Um, and uh, in December, when I first started asking this question, about 54% of our members thought that they would get better at some point in 2022, right? Uh, although the reality is that was mostly cautious optimism about the second half of this year. Flash forward to now, which is when we're in the second half of 2022, and that's almost the same percentage expected to be sometime in 2023. So mm -hmm. I think these issues have become much more stubborn um, uh, and, and much uh, much more permanent than I suspect that we were hoping, right? That, that there's still cautious optimism that they'll get better, uh, but but some of these things, like like the, the worker shortage or truck shortage, are more structural in nature and are going to take a while. Uh, obviously, the chip shortage is one that that you're seeing a lot of action in. You know, obviously, President Biden signed the the Chips uh, Act today, right? Uh, and so that hopefully will lead to uh, some improvement in the chips issue. In 2024, right? It's going to take a while for these facilities to get up and running, but hopefully that will provide some resilience moving forward, at least on that on that that score. Yeah, very very interesting and kind of echoing from our client base. Supply chain, like you said, um, kind of a fits all type uh, buzzword now, but it's uh, we really have to drill down into the the details, and uh, we hear a lot of um, nearshoring nearshoring activities where kind of clients asking us to help them to basically relocate um, manufacturing cap capabilities from um, Asia to uh, ideally North America. And then uh, talking about, you know, how, how can this be done efficiently? And unfortunately, there's no quick fix, right, for the supply chain. So we're also talking, even if you make the decision today, it's not be, you, you're not 
you're not going to see the fruits of that decision until probably two years uh, in the future. So, well, it is clear that manufacturers of all stripes are looking at the supply chain differently. Again, that's been going on for a while, even going back to the trade war or even before that. But I do think we're in a unique opportunity now where so many companies are struggling with these bottlenecks and with the rising freight costs and with a number of other issues that this is a unique opportunity for North America and for the U.S. to attract more of that investment to, 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 to at least to, to here as much as possible. Yeah. You touched on this uh, briefly as one of the, the, the major, major problems, and we read about this um, daily, is basically inflation and what the Fed is doing, which um, uh, from my perspective, very, uh, you know, at least in the beginning, quite unexpected um, moves. Um, so so what's, what's your take on that? And how do you see the Fed kind of maybe winning back some, um, yeah, confidence from, uh, you know, um, the, yeah, the economy and, and, and other organizations watching the Fed, what, what the Fed is doing and uh, what's, your, what's your take on uh, the Fed measures? Well, much like the supply chain issues, inflation has become much more stickier than we would have hoped, right? Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we will be getting new readings of inflation over the next few days and, and weeks. Um, uh, and obviously, the, the June numbers, you know, you get 9.1% inflation on the consumer side, the, the producer price index um, is near a record high as well, right? And so you, you have uh, these, these issues out there that, ha- that inflation has become much more persistent, much more challenging. And I think the real worry is that, that companies and, and workers, et cetera, are, are kind of building in these expectations into their contracts, right? So you, you're, you're building in this, this wage and price spiral, right, that, it, that has to be dealt with. The good news is um, you're, you're, you're going to start seeing core inflation, at least on a year-over-year basis, start to edge a little lower over the coming months largely because of math, right? Uh, as you move through the course of this year and you're comparing July and August and September of this year with July, August and September of last year, you're going to start seeing that year over year number start to, to, to pull back a little bit. So that's, that might be comforting a little bit. Um, we will be getting a new July consumer price index reading um, tomorrow, for instance, and, and it's, I, I would expect it to go down a little bit, largely because uh, energy prices, gasoline has gone down, right? So that, that, that should be welcome news. But um, inflation is still going to be w- way too high, right? Um, and I, I still see the consumer price index on a year-over-year basis being roughly 6% year-over-year by the end of the year. So even, even if that moderates, it's still going to be very elevated. Uh, and the more important measure for the Fed is the, the consumer, is the PCE deflator, right? The, the personal consumption expenditures deflator. I, I see that roughly pulling debt back to about three and a half to four percent year over year on a core basis, and that's essentially almost double the Fed's goal, right? Uh, which is two percent. And so the Fed is obviously acting, going to act, continue to act very aggressively, right? As it as it uh, as it should, right? You've already seen a couple seventy five basis point increases. There's a lot of talk, uh, especially after the strong job numbers that we got uh, for July about another maybe seventy five basis point increase. Um, I, th- I think a fifty point fifty basis point increase in September, I think is a lock. Uh, so whether they do seventy five really will hinge on what are the inflation data say, what is the August data on the labor market say, and I think that will d- decide whether that's fifty or seventy five. Um, Either way, the Fed is going to continue to to act very aggressively. But this plays into the conversation about recession and whether we'll go into a downturn or not, because, you know, monetary policy is is, it it takes time for it to work its way through the system. Essentially, they're trying to squeeze out inflationary pressures in the system without sending us into a recession. Um, And if they do that, we would get the so-called soft landing that the Fed is is hoping to get. But there's been skepticism about whether that's going to actually happen. The Fed has never successfully been able to squeeze out inflation without without uh, causing a downturn. I think the Fed is willing to take the risk of a downturn if if it means squeezing out some of these inflationary expectations and inflationary pressures in the system. Um, so I so I guess on, on, on the one hand, you're going to start seeing some inflationary pressures moderate a little bit, but they're going to still stay way too elevated. And I think uh, it's still theoretically possible that, that a recession can be averted, although, as I noted earlier, uh, 
the likelihood of one has continued to go up, right, in terms of a recession. I, I still would peg uh, the risk of a recession over the next year are, are around 50%, right? So um, mm-hmm. certainly that risk has gone up significantly over the last couple months, um, but it, there's still there's still a likelihood that we could still avert it, but it would, it would really hinge on the Fed's ability to really thread the needle very delicately. Yeah, yeah. No, very, very good, um, Chad. Uh, really appreciate your time here, spending with us on on these topics. And you know, it's good to uh, to to learn about you know that uh, we might be talking ourselves in a recession if we uh, you know um, bring it up too often. Uh, however, the the facts seem to be that um, while there's still a fifty percent uh, likelihood of a recession. Um, approaching um there's also a 50 percent chance it can be avoided or it can be at least a soft landing we're all hoping for so so thank you for your time and um for our audience please uh take some time um sign up for chats twitter and linkedin feed very um helpful and informative um the newsletter is a must read uh, for me every monday to stay on top of things and Yeah, appreciate you joining. And for um, our audience, we have a couple uh, follow-up uh, podcasts planned where we're going to dive a little bit more into the the blocking and tackling from an operational standpoint, just uh, touching on things like nearshoring uh, we talked about today, talking about um, automation, talking about how to get more efficient with your organization, really prepare your organization uh, um, for a recession or what can you do in running scenario analysis if you lose 10% of your uh, revenue, what um, else it's, is that going to do to your organization? Um, so thanks for uh, making time, chat, and uh, looking forward to uh, catching up soon on this and other topics. Thanks again for having me.